What's up everybody, Jackson Galaxy, your cat daddy here. If you missed the September 2020 cat camp, you missed a great Ask Me Anything between me and Hannah Shaw and moderated by our good friend Chris Gutierrez who runs Cat Kate, a wonderful cat cafe in Chicago. Check it out if you can, if you're in town. In the meantime, when you cut me and Hannah loose, it's sometimes chaotic, sometimes uh, a little crazy and always a lot of fun. So check it out. Chris had his hands full the other day. I hope you like it. Let us know in the comments if you liked it as well and what you'd like to see in the next Cat Camp. All right, light, love, and mojo to you. Have fun with this one. Well, hello. Uh, I'm Christopher Gutierrez. I'm the co-founder and director of the Cat Cave Rescue and Cat Cafe uh, that I run with my partner, Shelly, in Chicago, and I will be hosting this AMA between um, the illustrious Jackson Galaxy and um, my wonderful friend, Hannah Kitten Lady Shaw. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with Hannah Shaw, I'm gonna give you a quick introduction. Um, she needs no introduction, but um, let me read off this extremely long piece of paper here. Um, she's a cat rescuer and one of the loudest voices uh, in animal advocacy with over a million followers on Instagram and on YouTube both. Uh, she's a TNR expert, the authority on neonatal kitten care, um, <clears throat> the founder of her nonprofit, the or Orphan Kitten Club, and a New York Times bestselling author. And she's also my friend. Uh, also, along with, uh, uh, along with uh, our little talky talk is going to be Jackson Galaxy. <laughs> hey guys! Well, now we see the uh, the real deal behind uh, the live business here. I, I I'm sitting here going, am I? Am I is, is it all right? Am I good? Am I good? <laughs> Me too. So, um, I it, it's it, you know what? And and to everybody out there, we we've been monitoring. You know, we've had little ups and downs and everything today, but you know it is what it is. Chris, thanks for being here with us. Oh, thank you for having me and trusting me with this. You know, better you than me. <laughs> trusting you. Just can you trust me or can you trust Hannah? I am super excited to be here. And I do have kittens at my feet right here. So if you see me looking down, it's because I'm looking at these lovely little ones. This is Kalu, one of my foster kittens. So you'll see kittens popping in and out throughout this session. You're just flaunting. You're just flaunting the kittens. That's just great. You know, I'm I'm surrounded. Uh, you... <laughs> I too gorgeous. So, uh, Jackson, um, I believe there's a video about the litter genie that you would like to show us. Yeah. Well, first of all, I absolutely want to thank Litter Genie for being a uh, a part of Cat Camp as they've been in the past, and for donating a bunch of litter genies uh, to the prize packages today. But uh, yeah, let's show a quick video about litter genie. We'll be back on the other side. There we go. Like I said, it was quick. So quick question for you. Um, how many litter genies do you have? Yeah. Uh, well, let's put it this way. Uh, <laughs> litter genie wise, uh, I have a litter genie for every litter box. We have uh, seven cats, so we have seven litter boxes. So we have seven litter genies. You guys do the math. And they come in the different sizes. So we have them mixed up around the house, the regular, the XL. Um, but Honestly, I can't even remember what it was like to have to walk around with the litter and bring it to wherever garbage cans or whatever. Hannah, yeah. you've got to have as many yeah. as I I'm, do. I'm like literally, I'm literally sitting next to one right now. Um, I have a litter genie in every room where, uh, every room that there's a litter box. So like right now I'm in my kitten room. I have two litter boxes in here. I have one litter genie. Um, in the other kitten room, yes, I have a bunch of kitten rooms in my house. My other kitten room, I have an XL um, litter genie next to litter boxes. But I have, I just, was just thinking about this. I think I have 10 litter boxes in my house. We got a lot, a lot of litter going on. So that means a lot of scooping. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, so listen, we uh, got over 2,000 questions 
um, that people wanted to ask you. So um, obviously we're not gonna be able to get to all of them. Um, but before we begin and jump in, uh, I wanna throw out a handful of rapid fire questions that you answer just as quickly as possible. You don't know what these questions are, but I thought of them in my brain. Um, oh boy. <laughs> wow. Don't worry. Don't worry. Oh, um, no. <laughs> there's just questions that like I actually started thinking about and I was like, I want to know about you. Um, okay. So what's your favorite animated movie? And I want to go with Jackson first. My favorite animated movie uh, is, uh, you know, I, I can only go. Oh, God, I don't freaking know. You know, it's really funny. I was a huge fan of uh, Ralph Bashke back in the, the day. And uh, he okay, whatever you guys. It was it was when animation was like flip cards, but um, I loved all of his movies. And I think just animation wise, I don't know, man. I, I like the last one I watched was, um, was Django. So uh, anyway, whatever. Ralph okay. Bashy rules. Anna. Uh, my favorite is definitely Alice in Wonderland. It's like my sad day movie. If I'm feeling sad, I put on Alice in Wonderland. It was my favorite as a kid. And it just so happens that all of my kittens that are in this room right now are actually named after like a poem from the book. So um, I love Alice in Wonderland. Well, that's adorable because you kind of look like a Disney princess right now. So oh, well, to thanks. that point, <laughs> what, um, I'm going to start with Hannah again. What is... Where's your favorite place to relax? The bath. That I do know. <laughs> <laughs> that I do know. Uh, Jackson. I gotta echo that. I gotta be honest. Like it, it's um, one of the joys of, of traveling around the world. Was like, how many bathtubs can I can I find? I'm I'm a bathtub guy as well. And the funny thing is, we don't really have one in my house. Like for me, well, you know, I'm not. I'm not Hannah size, I'm Jackson size. So it's, it's, it's a challenge, but always like, yeah, the water was always the most relaxing place for me. Baths are underrated, but um, Jackson, to you again, what's your favorite topping on pizza? Favorite topping on pizza would be, well, at the moment, see, the fun thing is like those impossible meatballs uh, that you can get on top of pizza. I haven't had them yet. Uh-huh, yeah, that's rocking. Hannah? Uh, well, I would say olives just to make you grumpy, Chris, because I know you hate that, but um, I'm going to go with sun-dried tomatoes. Classic. Okay. Donuts or pizza? Jackson, go. Uh, pizza, hands pizza. down. I'm a New Yorker, man. I'm a New Yorker. Okay, well, then that, comes to our, that goes to our next question, which is uh, East Coast weather or West Coast weather? Jackson. That's a tough one, man, because honestly, I live on the West Coast now. I love the sunshine and everything, but I really miss seasons. So I'll take East Coast. Hmm. East Coast heart, West Coast weather. I knew this was going to be a very divisive question because I'm <laughs> on both coasts. <laughs> no, I'm West Coast weather all the way. That's why I'm here. But I'll always be an East Coast girl at heart. See, that's the thing is I've got like 10 years on you on the West Coast. So, so at this point, it's like you think about autumn and autumn in no. New York is just no matter what you do, <laughs> <No>. man. <laughs> I don't think about autumn. I think about endless summer. <laughs> All right. What's your favorite place that you've traveled internationally? Hannah. Is this, uh, oh, gosh. Probably Thailand. And, and I have to say the, the attitude towards cats there is so like beautiful and eye opening and people are so compassionate there. And um, I loved visiting Thailand. Jackson? It's a toss up for me. I, I think my time in New Zealand was just amazing. And the people there were just, I'd never met a grumpy person in New Zealand. And plus I think they had the highest per capita uh, cat guardianship in the world. They're, they're over 50% of people in New Zealand have cats. So that's the one thing, but I gotta say in terms of just like being in awe, um, I got a chance to go to the Galapagos Islands a few years ago. And that's just, just the amount of reverence towards animal life in one place. Um, I've never experienced before. And, and uh, it's an amazing, an amazing experience. Awesome, okay, Hannah. What's more stressful, LA traffic or ringworm? 
Um, well, I am really not into traffic. Um, this is a hard question. I would say traffic because ringworm I'm, I'm good for, like, I'm, I'm happy to deal with, uh, I'm not happy to deal with traffic, but it is stressful. I have a ringworm kitten right now. And, uh, the, the most stressful thing about it is not that it's not the doing the treatment. It's just how much I want him to be able to have friends. I just want him to like have buddies and He's in quarantine and can't, so it's a toss up, but I would say I would rather deal with ringworm than traffic. Jackson, LA traffic or ringworm? You know what's, what's really funny though, is because I, I'm sure you deal with a, a bunch of ringworm that like it becomes this thing. Okay, I deal with it all the time, so I'm cool yeah. to a certain degree. And I deal with LA traffic all the time, so I'm cool with it to a certain degree. Ringworm <laughs> makes me flop sweat, like the, like the idea <laughs> of ringworm. You know, I've gotten ringworm, I think, myself like three times and wow. and i just it no it just no 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 <laughs> all right so um the one of the first questions that someone asked and that i was re actually really curious about because i don't know is how did you two meet jackson do you remember jackson you, I, I remember I the remember. very first time you do you it was you at a best the friends oh you do remember um we were in like this it's actually, it sounds very magical when you put it this way. It was, a, it was like a marble pink castle house. <laughs> Remember that? It was like this yes. amazing house. And it was this fundraiser for Best Friends Animal Society. And we had a mutual friend and we met there. And I think we escaped into an interesting little side room. And we just talked, 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 talked. Talk, and then we never stopped talking since. And, 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 and honestly, and it's funny because people don't, really know this much about I mean I'm not the if, if, if I don't have a job to do socially like at parties and whatever I'm not good I'm not good and Hannah was like like my savior like just sort of took me through we disappeared it was all good made an appearance fundraised everything was cool and left so yeah okay. Hannah saved my life <laughs> oh no that was fun I mean I think Jackson and I are both like we're both extroverts who also like sometimes you get a little bit overwhelmed maybe by crowds and and that was a we had a great conversation and then um just kept working together after that um, a lot of people saw in 2016 we did this big road trip also involving best friends where we had like 50 kittens in a in a van and we drove like 25 hours together um i would say that's when we became really good friends because you can't go through <laughs> a 25 hour kitten poop road trip without getting close right <laughs> no and, and again I'll, I'll just say there's there's always things about Hannah that impressed me but on that road trip because we had to drive through we went from California we hit Utah at some point at that point and both of us being vegan it was just, at that point you, we basically had like candy and stuff in the middle of the van but in terms of eating forget about it there was no place to eat and Hannah knew how to pull into like some I don't remember what kind of a restaurant it was and Denny's. make them make us some, it was a Denny's and make horrible. them make us something. It was horrible, but you made it happen. And that was important. You know, what's funny is that I remember watching that before I knew either one of you. Uh, and I kept thinking, oh, they must have the stage where they put them in a car and they drive like 15 minutes and get like no. the foot they need and yeah. then they roll. And then they hop in like whatever, I don't know, whatever other car and then they move on to the next thing. So. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I can tell you Jackson, like, when I'd be driving Jackson, we, we'd either like be talking or you'd have headphones on and be trying to like get some shut eye in, a, in the car, you know, in your seat in the car. That's how road trips, that's how it goes. We drove overnight, we saw the sunset, we saw the sunrise. Jackson tried to put water in the uh, tire and they actually aired Seriously? that on Animal Planet. <laughs> no, they aired it on Animal Planet. And yeah, was like, oh, it was God. one of those things where it was like, it, it was late at freaking night and there was an air hose and a water hose, and they were <laughs> they looked alike, man. I was tired, no shame. dude. I, no shame. But let me just say, I, I would have done funny. the same thing, probably. You put you posted a picture. I think you posted a picture a couple of days ago of the two of us. It was like <laughs> the sun was coming up at that point. We were at a truck stop, fully, absolutely, uh, that driving all night, like you can't even see straight thing, and uh, buying little animal furry hats and playing 
computer bingo. It was yeah. it was great. It was, it was great. So yeah, Chris, we, we we did the drive. We dealt with kitten poop. Put water in tires, and every and and one of them got home. So that and was cool. I think it was that trip where I mentioned that there was this idea of like doing some kind of event thing that then became you and Christina meeting, right? Oh yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. 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 There, you're right. Full circle. Full circle. Yeah. It was a, it and was, here we it all was are. An eventful, it was an eventful event. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to move on to a couple more questions that are a little bit more serious. Um, I'm going to direct this one at Hannah first and then Jackson I'd like to you know hear from you as well but what are the highest impact activities for those with little time to foster or volunteer sure so I think a lot of people see you know the work that I do or that Jackson does and they're like well I don't have the time to do all of that um, and that's okay if you don't have time to foster or volunteer there's a lot of other things that you can do um, the quickest one that comes to mind for me is every person has a different network you know your friend network your colleagues. So use your network to spread the word about adoptable cats because, you know, the people I can reach, you reach somebody different than I do. So follow um, local shelters and rescue organizations when you see them seeking homes for cats. Just share those with your network, you know, click share or even send it out to your coworkers. Hey, I saw this cat. Anybody looking for a cat? That can make a big difference. Um, another easy one is Facebook fundraisers. Facebook fundraisers can do a lot just by using your network of friends and family to, you know, direct some good towards an organization. Um, a big one my nonprofit always needs help with is transport. So even if you just have an hour or two hours to give towards, you know, maybe for us, it's like picking up a kitten and taking them to a vet, you know, that can make a world of difference mm -hmm. for us or going to the shelter and picking up a cat who needs, you know, who needs uh, rescue, you know, transport is a really big way to help. Um, the last thing I would say is just uh, use whatever skill and lifestyle you already have to help cats. So if you're crafty, make crafts for cats. If you're an accountant, I guarantee you there's a local nonprofit who would love <laughs> your services. Um, you know what I mean? So, yes, you know, you, know you use the skills that you have to help in whatever way you can. There's so many different ways to help. Awesome. Uh, I completely agree with everything that you just said. Sign me up for your newsletter. Uh, Jackson, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, all I would say is, is and, and I think this is something that we can all look at right now, What in, in the state of what has become rescue over the past, what, six, seven months now, um, which is that a lot of people got involved because all of a sudden they found themselves being asked in a big way to foster, for instance, and uh, and we had a little bit of time. And I think so many of those new foster parents found out how, how it wasn't, they didn't have to give over their entire lives in order to do something and to save a life and to help out the shelters who were just in so much trouble. Uh, so that's one thing. And I, I, I think that what's really important is I, I'm guilty of it. I think everyone to a certain degree is where you, you think of, well, I'd like to do this. And then you think of the biggest possible impact that you could have in the whole wide world and how you would have to give over your whole life to it. And just to remember that you don't, like Hannah was just saying about transport, that's such a, a, it's kind of a gimme. Um, a lot of TNR trappers would just, just give their left foot for someone who would just take their cats to their spay appointments um, and back again. Th there are small things that everyone can do. And I think that if you ask anyone who's done a small thing, they'll say that small thing resulted in a big thing. I agree. Um, you mentioned something about the, you know, the last six months, the world has been completely changed uh, over the last six months. Um, which leads me to another question, Jackson, actually. Um, what have you learned most about yourself in the last six months? Well, <laughs> I mean, I definitely learned patience in a way that I don't think I had before. I, I, or if I did, I wasn't constantly working on it. I'm, I'm somebody who doesn't sit still very well at all. Mm -hmm. And I need to be, I just need to be working, moving, traveling, whatever it is. And I think just being grounded led me to grounding myself. Um, and, and I learned a lot about, um, I, I, I learned 
a lot about my sometimes moves towards perfectionism and and how I um, need to focus on the little things. You know, I've got seven cats and three dogs. We we started um, a life with chickens in, during the, the the pandemic and. And they all need something individually from both me and my wife at, at a certain point in the day and giving that to them and slowing down and uh, it, basically following my own advice, I think has been a, a big one. And Hannah, what do you think that you've learned over the last six months? Yeah, this has been a challenging time because like Jackson, I'm usually like, let's, let's go, let's do stuff. Um, and I think what's, what's happened for me is I've really doubled down on the impact I can make in my own community rather than, um, you know, a lot of the work that I usually do is out in, you know, different parts of the country, different parts of the world. And this has been a, actually a pretty welcome opportunity, I think, for me to be more like on the streets where I live, in the neighborhoods, trapping cats in my home, you know, seeing from from day one of a baby's life to eight weeks when they get adopted. Um, I think that I've really doubled down on making, you know, the impact hands on that I can make. Um, I always try to do like, you know, Jackson was saying, like the biggest thing that I can be doing, and I do have a lot going on of, you know, upcoming projects that I'm excited about. But I think during this time, it's been a time of kind of like looking at what can I do um, hands on right now, you know, like what can I do to raise this little baby and make sure he goes to a good place. And um, that's given me a real sense of purpose during this time. I think that when the world feels out of control, uh, it's good to focus on something that you can make right. You know, I can't make everything in the world right, but I can, but for this little baby who came to me covered in fleas and fly eggs as a one day old, I can make that right. You know, this is something I can make right. And that, that, feels really positive for me. Okay, and that leads us to like kind of the next question, uh, which I'll pose to you, Hannah, again, which is um, what's the best way for children to get involved in animal rescue, especially during the pandemic? You know, kids are so naturally compassionate and I get a lot of kids reaching out to me saying, you know, how can I help? You know, my mom doesn't want me to foster. And again, it's like fostering is not the only way to help. Um, there are a lot of things that kids can do. You don't have to wait until you're an adult and go to vet school. You know, I know a lot of kids think, well, I'll be a vet someday, but you can, even if you're six years old, you can do something right now. Um, a couple ideas. One is if you have a school project, you can do a school project on cat welfare. You know, um, if there's an opportunity to interview somebody, um, maybe interview somebody from your local shelter or rescue group. Um, you know, if you have to choose a topic, see if there's ways that you can educate even your teacher and of course your fellow students on cats. Um, you can ask your teacher or librarian to read, um, you know, a book that is about cat welfare. I do have a book for kids um, called Kitten Lady's Big Book of Little Kittens. Um, make sure that your library has that so that they can be teaching um, other young people. Um, another thing that you could do is, you know, if you have a skill for making something, I know, I know a kid who makes like buttons, you know, buttons that you wear and he sells them and donates the proceeds to his local shelter. It's just like a old fashioned lemonade stand, but catified. So. Um, a lot of things you can do. And of course, if your parents are open to fostering, definitely there's things kids can do within that. You can be, you know, socializing the kittens. You can be opening those cans of cat food. And um, there's a lot of things that you can do. Jackson, do you have anything to add? She, uh, Hannah nailed almost everything I, I would have said. I, I think that one thing that, that, that maybe kids need to remember is that when it comes to just a lot of times just that compassionate animal centric um, way of life. We have, you guys have a lot to teach your parents, <laughs> you know, a lot of times your parents have locked themselves into just a way of thinking and you can help um, open their eyes, your family's eyes and your friends as well. And it doesn't take much. Um, it's just learning more about the cats in your community. And, and as Hannah said, I mean, just little things that uh, you can start with and just, it, it goes a long way. I mean, I've known so many kids who have taught their parents about sheltering, about the, the cats that need homes in their area. And of course, you know, as a parent, you're like, no, 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 I don't, I don't want a cat. I don't want, I don't want two cats. I don't want a litter of cats. 
but uh, there's a lot. There's a lot that, that kids can teach their parents. Okay. Um, so this is a great question. Uh, it's from Katie O'Brien, who, which I think does a really kind of um, apply to to both of you equally, and just maybe in like uh, different aspects. But um, I'm going to start with Hannah. Do you feel that bottle raised kittens have a higher risk for beha uh, behavioral problems problems later in life, since they don't get that mama cat training? Is there any way to mimic uh, mimic that, that to prevent issues? Yeah, this is a really common question. When I do my bottle baby workshops, people are like, oh, how do you deal with like, you know, the bottle baby kitten syndrome? And I really reject that idea. And I'll tell you why. Um, I do think that there's absolutely opportunity for kittens who are bottle raised to have behavioral problems. But I think that the, the most important thing there is the husbandry. If you are taking care of that kitten and meeting all of their developmental needs, then the kitten is, you know, is given an opportunity just like if they had a feline mama. There is, there are some important differences, of course. Um, but the thing that I would say is the bigger issue is singleton kittens. Um, so kittens who are not raised with any other cats at all. Um, if I have an orphan and they're solo, the most important thing is to make sure that I get them a friend. So even if I get a two week old foster kitten who's alone, I will tell the shelter, I'm looking for another two week old and I'm gonna quarantine them for two weeks so that when they're four weeks old, they can be friends with each other. Um, so I think important, you know, important things are making sure that that kitten um, has feline companionship. If it's not a mom, then another kitten who's the same, um, around the same age, uh, meeting all of their important needs. So like making sure they're clean is a big one. A lot of foster parents, um, you know, they feed and they, you know, help them go to the bathroom, but they don't keep them clean. Mom cats keep them very clean. If they're not clean, they don't feel safe. And think about, you know, early childhood experience has a lot of impact on, of course, how we are as adults. And I think the same applies for cats. So um, make them feel safe, make them feel clean. If they're cold, make them feel warm, all of those things and make sure they have um, feline companionship, I think is, is very important. Absolutely. Uh, Jackson. Um, I yeah, know generally yeah. Don't, don't deal with bottle feeding kittens, um, but you do um, have made a show 11 seasons out of dealing with behavioral problems. So is yeah. there anything that you could add to that? I, I, don't, I don't necessarily, in, in, a, in a lot of ways, I don't think it's necessarily behavioral problems. Um, and I couldn't agree more with, with Hannah about the need, I mean, it's more about singleton bottle babies than it is about bottle babies in general, that um, having stand-ins for their siblings, um, having other cats around to model behavior, especially during this really crucial moment in their life, um, there's this, this phase, the critical learning phase that's approximately two to nine weeks old. These guys learn a ton in that really packed in moment. And if they don't have cats to model their behavior after, uh, it's not that it's, it's necessarily going to be problematic. It's just that it creates more hurdles um, for them as, as they get past that phase. The other thing that I think that we have to be really hyper aware of, even I would say even more so than, you know, kittens who uh, weren't raised bottle babies is just to remember not to play with your hands, not to... Uh, encourage things like, you know, blanket wrestling and things like that, because kittens need to remember, they need to know how to retract claws, inhibit bites and things like that. And if we are encouraging them to do that in a very unwitting way, then it's going to continue. They're going to get older. They're going to bite harder. They're going to claw harder and you're going to get mad. <laughs> and, and, it, and it was kind of on you in the first place. But I think by and large, we're, I think, and Hannah, I think you would probably say that like in turn, and, and Chris, you've been around plenty of them, that it's not problems for the most part, it's ticks. Like you'll see, I see things in cats that were raised bottle babies. And like I said, especially singletons where they, their behavior is sometimes more geared towards humans than it is towards cats. They're, they're seeking us even more than they would other cats or it's, I can tell a bottle baby, I don't, I, you know, it, it, they could be nine years old and I could still, they, they, there's things they do, there's ticks that they will have that just say, you were raised around more humans than cats, you know? 
Yeah. So I can add to that a little bit. I can tell you, you know, I've raised hundreds of bottle babies and the feedback from my adopters is how are these cats so affectionate? They are just so very affectionate towards humans. A an observation I've made is that when I have bottle raised kittens versus mom raised kittens, um, the bottle raised kittens purr a lot more readily for me um, mm. than the mama raised ones, I think, because they see that they see humans as more maternal. Um, but there is some research that Michael Delgado has um, done about, um, you know, differences in attachments with um, bottle babies versus uh, mom raised kittens. And the um, a finding in that was that vocalizations were different um, when a kitten is left alone. If they are, if they have a mom, they're a little more secure. They don't meow as much um, if they don't have a mom, they're more vocal. They're more like attention seeking, like where is somebody? So I think that there's definitely differences, um, but I think that we can mitigate a lot of those. Um, and I very much agree with you. One important thing is don't teach them that you are a cat. Um, teach them that they can play with toys, they can play with their other feline friends, but they're not supposed to play with your feet and hands. Absolutely. Uh, that definitely plays right into the next question that I have. Uh, it's a little long. Um, I'm going to direct it first to Jackson. Uh, it's, I see a lot of why does my cat do X questions that are answered with, that's a common thing among orphan cats or kittens who are separated from their litters at a young age. I think in large part to Hannah's advocacy and education, we're getting better at saving orphan kittens and reducing neonatal euthanasia, euthanasia rates across the country. But I wonder if this is leading to a rise in orphan singleton behavior issues. Uh, Jackson, do you see that in your work? Um, and I guess that sort of ties in to what we were talking about before. I mean, I, I think, yeah. I, I mean, obviously, if, if you're saving more neonatal kittens, then you're going to see, you know, behaviors, I guess, that um, maybe you didn't see a generation ago or, or something. But but I don't necessarily think that that's a hurdle, nor do I think it's uh, problematic. I mean, there's a lot of folks who get, you know, kind of, you know, uh, what's the word, I'm prickly, because their cats do or they don't cover, like when they when they go into the litter box, and mm -hmm. and um, and that's not necessarily something that's just that just happens because you were a bottle baby or a singleton or anything like that. I think really the advice that, that we've been giving in, in different ways is holds true for this one, which is, um, you know, give them uh, experiences, remind them uh, what is appropriate with humans and, and how to be a cat through other cats. And there's always catching up. I don't think that there's necessarily a there's nothing bad about saving kittens. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> no. And, you know, to add a little thought on the end of that. As a movement, we are getting better at saving cats, and that means we're getting better at saving all kinds of cats, whether that's um, neonatal kittens, whether that's cats um, who are FIV or leukemia positive, whether that's cats with diabetes, whether that's cats with mobility challenges. All of these cats are worthy of protection and being saved, and um, I think to see that as a, a problem is not the right lens to look through. We wanna see this as an opportunity to save many different kinds of cats. And the better we get at saving cats, the more we have to become educated about the various um, types of populations there are. This is why I love Cat Camp because there's something for everyone. Everybody can find their piece, educate themselves about how to do it really well and save so many different kinds of cats' lives. Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen a real, a real nice change in senior adoptions. I think that that's been a really great change because, I mean, don't forget back in the day that, that when I started in the shelters, it, seniors wouldn't last, you know, because they were number one, we, it, our uh, shelter culture at that point was very cage oriented and, and seniors would go downhill very fast. So now we're marketing them with, with, a better dexterity and folks are realizing how great it is to have seniors that they're great company in certain households and um and that has been a that's been a huge huge change and a big bonus um because it you know i i personally saw so many lives that didn't have to end even though they were older but um to know now that they can go to homes and have a 
I mean, I, it might be cliche to say a second chance, but honestly, to be able to live out your life, you know, knowing love and a stable home uh, is is pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, there's a second part to that question, which is what can those of us who foster orphan kittens do to prevent these behaviors from developing? Um, the TNR and CASA method to keep it from happening, of course, and lots of play with toy and not hands when it does happen. But do y'all have any other tips or recommendations? I'm going to shoot this one over to Jackson first. You know, like I said, I think, I think we've been hitting on this uh, pretty hard. I think, you know, from my point of view, bringing out what I call the raw cat early in life is so beneficial teaching and, and again this is the the flip side of don't play with your hands bring out interactive toys and bring them out really soon and just let little ones know just remind them this is what i'm here for this is what i do this is what thousands of years of this sort of evolutionary straight line has brought me to this moment and and the more confident they are at that age um the more confident they're going to be as adults and knowing how crucial uh, play is to their lives on a daily basis, I think is one thing that, that will lead you to not have to resolve issues uh, going forward. Because confidence to me is everything and, uh, in cats. And so besides play, it's just this, this sense of ownership of territory. And that comes with, you know, having a catified home. And so the more you teach them to explore safely and play safely and discover that raw cat, you know, everything, everything usually turns out for the better. I, I agree. Uh, Hannah, do you have any other tips or recommendations? Your kitten needs another kitten. That's all I'm going to say. Kittens <laughs> That's are supposed right. to be in pairs. Get your kitten another kitten. And I'm not just trying to upsell you here. This is for your own good. <laughs> yep. Get your kitten another kitten. Yeah, it's like we should have like a little overcoat. Like, what do I got to do to get you into <laughs> yeah, this kitten? Right? Right? Got a kitten? Well, I got exactly what you need. Another yeah. kitten. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I'm sorry, and I'm I, and I'm I'm boneheaded for missing that one. But again, two is so many so much better than one. I mean, yeah. I, I so much better, so many better. Anyway, both. Uh, <laughs> it's 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 a great thing to uh, to raise them together. And and you know the the thing is funny because people always think that we're trying to upsell. But honestly, you it's think both. it's going to be double the work. I you, but also, well, it's yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you know, I mean, it is. You know, people think it's going to be double the work, and it's just not. Especially when oh. it comes to that socializing and teaching one another, and that moment, right, when you're a kitten and you go up to your your brother or your friend brother, and you, and you go up and like you bite them really hard on the ear, and they're like, boom, and he's like, oh, okay. All right, well, I won't do that again. You know, they teach each that other that kind of learning. Oh, yeah, that's, and that's what we say at our shelter all the time. We always say one cat is this much effort, and two cats is this much effort. It's not, it's it's a little bit more scooping and a little bit more food, and they just take care of each other. Yep. So, um, the next question I have here, uh, I want to shoot to Hannah first, which is my best friend and I adopted kittens from the same litter. Uh, we don't have uh, we have cats at home. Don't worry. Um, would like the kittens. We would like to have kitten play dates, and would that be fun beneficial to them? Um, well, I think that you know, just because two kittens are related, if you separate them, they may not. You know, if it's a year from now, they may see each other and be a little bit like, "Oh, who are you? I don't know who you are." Um, I think if you're gonna have kittens visiting each other, I would say do it soon and frequently so that they have some memory of, of each other. But I also don't think, cats are not always the biggest fans of like moving around between spaces. Jackson might have um, a perspective here though. So I'm interested in hearing his his answer. Well, I, I know I, 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 it's funny because at that point, if you, <laughs> back to the upsell, I mean, if you're gonna them shuttle them together. around and just, yeah, just, either put them together or they should each have friends at home. I, I yeah, I, although, and it's funny cause I can hear the chat going in my brain right now where someone's like, no, my cats love play dates. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's totally cool. Um, in my experience, 
as is Hannah's experience, the idea of bringing cats to a different territory, and remember, they're so connected to that territory, that going into a new one and expecting them to immediately sort of roll around like dogs, um, not really, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't think it's worth the effort, really. And like Hannah said, the sort of familial bond really only goes so far in life. Uh, once they've been separated, they've been separated. So again, that's my experience. Yeah. Uh, so Jackson, I just want to ask you um, a lone question uh, and then I'm going to kind of flip between you two. Um, how much conflict between cats is too much? Is some light slapping to be expected? <laughs> I don't know what it is about that question. Some light slapping. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I uh, okay. Bit. So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it, it, you really need to know the, what, what, what play looks like and what an argument looks like. And I know that I'm, I'm totally oversimplifying, but unless there's fur coming out in claws, skin broken, somebody peeing or pooping in the spot because it was really not cool, somebody hiding afterwards, it's, it's usually play or rough play a little bit. But when we're talking about a little like, hey, you got too close, you're in my bubble, slap, slap. Um, you wanna check to see are claws retracted? Is, is it something where it's just, what I'm doing right now is I've got some tools here. This is the first step. It's, it's the slap with claws in. Then if you keep coming at me and you keep disrespecting my bubble here, then the claws are gonna come out and then the teeth are gonna come out. It's one, two, three usually. Um, there's also vocal cues that are happening at that point. There's, there's body cues happening at the same time. You as the human in this, you gotta use your, your you know, learn that body language, learn those sounds, um, learn about all cats, filter it down into your cats. And the question, the answer is gonna be different for pretty much everybody with multiple cats in their homes, but look for those big signs, you know, and hiding is one of them. If someone is getting, you know, hit a lot or picked on a lot, they're going to start taking themselves out of the rotation a little bit and you're going to be looking for them and, and that kind of thing. So, and litter box issues, oh, all kinds of stuff. All right. So Hannah, as a rescuer, how do you deal with people who surrender their cats or don't spay and neuter or who don't understand TNR? Yeah, um, well, when you get involved in rescue, you think you're gonna just be working with animals, but actually you do deal with a lot of um, people. And so I think the, the most important thing to remember is to approach every situation with kindness, um, to assume really assume the best about people and remember that you didn't always know what you know. Um, so you're in a position where you can really educate, um, but you can't educate if you start by pointing your finger at somebody. Nobody learns like this. Um, so I think it's very important that you meet people where they are. Now, sometimes that's frustrating, right? Like sometimes you're in a neighborhood and somebody's feeding a bunch of cats and they refuse to spay and neuter the cats. They don't want your help doing um, trapping. That's something I deal with a lot. And what I try to do is find common ground with them. So, um, you know, this term like a compliment sandwich, you got to give people like a compliment sandwich. You're going to give them the difficult stuff in the middle. But I start with something, some common ground and some kind of way of being kind and connecting to the person. So like if I see somebody feeding cats in a neighborhood and they're not sterilized, I might say to them, I think it's so wonderfully compassionate that you're feeding cats and you care enough to try to help these cats. Um, you know, if it's somebody reaching out to me to return a kitten and I'm frustrated by that, I might say to them, I think it's so wonderful that you had the compassion in your heart to reach out to me about this, you know, give them that first, then meet them where they are. Don't meet them where you are because where you are is so many steps ahead of, you know, you, you know about rescue, you know about trap, neuter, return, you, you know, have made a lifelong commitment to your cat and you can't imagine ever giving them up. But some people are in a different place than you. So I think meeting people, like asking questions instead of just like pointing at somebody, ask them questions. What's going on for you? Try to understand it, empathize with it and know that like every situation is not going to be the same. Sometimes somebody reaching out to surrender a cat to you honestly is a an important thing for them to do because of something that's going on in their life. And 
all I can say is I, I feel grateful that I'm not in that situation. And I try to empathize with the person and be a resource. So um, educate, be a resource, be kind. Even if you want to just scream, that's what group texts with your friends are for. Text your friends and be like, oh my God, I can't believe this. And then take a deep breath and be kind. That's what I would say. Perfect. Um, Jackson, um, I know it's a very general question, but I'm interested to see which direction you take this, which is um, what's one cat fact you think all kitty parents should know? I, I think the most important, and I know this sounds totally over simplified but it's one fact and i guess the fact is that your cat's not a dog uh and um i i think that we're all guilty uh to some degree or another at certain points in our cat lives of um looking at cats through dog colored glasses and and that means that we are thinking that that it a good cat means that cat thinks that the cat should want to be with you more. And if they don't, they're aloof and antisocial. They should want to participate in family sort of gather. They should listen to you more. They should be more obedient. All of these things, even down to the way that cats show love versus dogs, you know, which is that as a cat, I love in the moment. I'm a very present. It is a great, it's great to be with you. I'm going to sit on your chest. Be, I love you gotta go, you know? And we should appreciate that for being a great thing because that's cat. Whereas dog is like, I need to be with you and, and the sun and the moon and you. And that's because we've made them that way over thousands of years and cats, we didn't. Um, and I think it's, it, it, you know, as, as, you know, as Hannah was just saying about uh, people, it's important with cats is, is to meet them where they are. Um, they are cats. And in my book, they're barely domesticated. And after all this time, and they're doing us big favors in terms of the small things that we take for granted, like going in a litter box, like being okay in a home with other beings, dogs, cats, children, us. It's, it's taken them a long time to get there. But the more folks learn about cats, um, and, and, and realize that, that we expect things from them that it's another species, you know? Um, I, I think we would, we would be more open to a richer relationship with them. Great. Um, actually, let me turn this into one for Hannah. Um, what's one kitten fact you think all new kitten parents should know? Aside from that they need two of them? Yes. Um, <laughs> well, I think one thing that a lot of people don't think about is that if you are in a situation where you have indoor only cats or kittens who you're raising indoors, um, they only have the environment that you give them. They only have the life that you provide. Think of it like, you know, their own Truman show or something, right? Like you set the stage of whether they can see the sun because you opened the curtain or they never see the sun because you kept the curtains closed. Um, they, they're sitting there all day and they don't have the opportunity to, you know, stumble upon a, a, you know, squirrel in the yard and be curious about that. They don't have the chance to have a leaf blow by them and go, Ooh, like that was an enticing thing. And so these, these indoor cats, obviously I have indoor cats, like it's a lot of us do, and that's a, a great way to keep our cats safe. Um, but our, you know, when we're, when we're raising kittens or when we're um, caring for cats of our own, I think it's really important to always be mindful, you know, what's something new that I can show my cat today, even if it is something as simple as bringing leaves inside to show them, right? Or like giving them, instead of throwing out the cardboard box with your delivery items in it, give it to them. They're like, ooh, something new showed up. This is exciting, you know? Um, I think with kittens, Harness train your kittens. Every single adopter that I have gets a whole book, an Adventure Cats book that teaches you how to do a lot of really exciting enrichment, clicker training, um, harness training. And my favorite adopters are, are adopters who start their kittens young um, so that they can have those outdoor, those safe outdoor opportunities. Perfect. Um, okay, so both of you are very public figures and people know you, what you're from. Um, 
and uh, Hannah, you're very public with the amount of the kittens that you take in, that you foster, people fall in love with them, um, they follow them even after they've been adopted out. Uh, so this question is for you specifically, which is, uh, which kitten or kittens have been the hardest to say goodbye to? Oh gosh. Well, if you ask me like, oh, are you going to be sad to say goodbye? The thing I always say is like, goodbye is the goal. I'm so happy when they get adopted. And that is true. But what I will say is I get very attached to certain types of kittens. So um, I what is really- it? What does I, it take for a kitten to break through and be one of your favorites? <laughs> Um, I really like working with mobility, mobility challenged kittens a lot. Um, so I recently had a kitten named James who had no hind legs mm -hmm. and, um, he, I like cried thinking about him leaving also cause he was in my bedroom. So like when they're in my bedroom, it's like, they're just part of your every moment. Like I was sleeping with him and he had all these ramps and steps in the room. Um, but that was hard because I, you know, I still, that was like, I don't know, over a month ago. And I still wake up sometimes and I'm like, where's James? Where's James? I love that kitten. Um, but I am very glad I get to follow him on social media. And I talk to his adopter all the time and he just has the best life. I mean, he got such a great home and he has an opportunity in that home that he wouldn't have here. You know, he has two cats and a dog who all love him. He has a whole family of um, people who just dote on him all day. Um, and I have a lot going on. I have a lot of like animals to um, tend to. So uh, I'm happy for him, you know? It was hard, but it was like the right, correct thing to do. Um, and I'm very happy for him. But I think James, definitely, he's the one I, he's my, from this year, he's the one I still think. I was gonna say, day. Is that, is I've had a lot. Year, but... Fluctuate from my year. <laughs> From this year, it's James, definitely, because I'm just, oh, James, I just loved him. He went through so much. He really went through a lot. So I think if they go through a lot with me and they're in my bedroom, forget it. Um, you have I a little, love you have I a little love thing, like favorite kitten of 2016, 2017, <laughs> little plastic. <laughs> it's not a competition. All kittens, all, you know, Unless all it comes to James. Beautiful, <laughs> but. And he wins. <laughs> this guy's pretty spectacular, too. Exactly. Yeah. So Jackson, um, on My Cat From Hell, which cat was the hardest to work with? You have one that Oy. sticks out. I, you know, yeah, the one that sticks out for me, and it's only also because, uh, yeah, well, there's a lot of becauses, but uh, we, I, I was called up to work with uh, this cat named Lux, who was the 911 cat up in Portland. Uh, and when I say the 911 cat, that was because it was like, I don't know if it was like inside edition or something like that where it broke originally, where there was this audio footage. Oh, <laughs> I can only laugh about it because I was there. For that. Did, did you ever hear it? Did you, the, the, the one where it's like, it, <laughs> it's, it's a guy and his wife and his baby. Oh, and the dog. They're all locked in the bathroom. Yeah, I was gonna say they were in the room or something like that. And they yeah, called they were locked in the left. bathroom. While the, you hear the cat in the background going thump, thump on the on the bathroom door. They were legitimately scared to death. Anyway, they were going to surrender him, and the, uh, and it wasn't going to look good for. Him. So we went up, and um, and it was one of those things. It was a very last second thing. We had actually just wrapped the season. We were done. It was a six month shoot. We were done. And the next day this happened. And the next day I was up there. And um, and the thing about Lux is that he was, there was, he was neurologically damaged in a way that um, I know it wasn't something he was born with. And, um, um, and I, I always thought that we were getting over a hump. You know, I got him in this foster home. I got him out of that home, which I think was the first stop, then into a foster home with amazing foster parents who fell in love with him. And then I get the call that he sent one of them to the hospital. Now I gotta go back to Portland and we're gonna work with him again. And it kept happening. And, and it was a real lesson in humility for me mm -hmm. because Lux was who and is who Lux is. And he wasn't going to fit in the box that I wanted to put him in. Success meant you were gonna live in a home with humans, 
be happy, be happy, Lux, be happy, you know? And, uh, and that's not how it went. And I was really fortunate to be able to get him into a wonderful sanctuary where he uh, lived really well for a number of years and then got adopted by one of his caretakers at the sanctuary. So now is in a home with somebody who understands him. And, but he was my biggest teacher for sure. That was a long answer, sorry. Wow, no, it was great. That was great. I was actually um, curious about that. Really um, so actually this will pertain to both of you because I believe both of you are vegan. Um, Hannah, do you have any tips for new vegans like me? Well, um, congrats on your compassionate decision. I love that. Um, I've been vegan so long that it's like hard for, it's like, this is just the air that I breathe. So it's like, how do you explain breathing air? But I'll try to answer. Um, I think the, the first tip I would give for transitioning to a vegan lifestyle is don't change that much about what you already do. If you already love eating something, just learn if you're, you know, if you like to eat at home, um, and you make tacos every Tuesday, don't say, Oh, I can't have tacos now learn how to do it. Vegan, like look up recipes, learn how to do what you already do and do it vegan. There's nothing that you can't, I mean, in 2020, there's nothing you can't make vegan. Now for um, restaurants and stuff like that, the main piece of advice I would give is don't keep doing what you're doing. Don't just go to the restaurant that you always go to every Monday and like look at the menu and go, oh, all they have is salad. Cause like, let's be honest, Jackson and I, we don't want to eat salad all the time. How often do you eat a salad? I don't eat a lot of salad. I should probably You're should. asking me. Um, <laughs> I don't, I probably should. I probably should. But um, I'm a junk food vegan myself. Um, so, you know, I would say instead of like going to the restaurant and then being that person who's like, oh, I can eat some sides. That restaurant's not for you. Look up the cool spots that have good vegan options in your community. And it might not be that it is, um, it might not be that it's an all vegan restaurant. Maybe you live in a community that doesn't have an all vegan restaurant. There are certain things that are in every community um, that you can, you can access a lot of uh, cuisines that you maybe have never tried before. Um, get, go to a Thai restaurant, go to a Vietnamese restaurant, Indian restaurants always have great vegan options. My favorite kind of food is Ethiopian food. I don't know if I ever would have branched out to eating Ethiopian food if I wasn't vegan. And then I found like, wow, this is actually the best thing ever. So um, don't be afraid with restaurants to try new things. Um, you know, there, there is, there are great options out there and don't let me catch you just eating salads at Denny's. That's horrible. <laughs> don't, you're better than my dinner, right? You're better than that. <laughs> Jackson, do you have any tips for anybody? Uh, yeah. maybe, on a maybe in a different direction with like dealing with, you know, like uh, friends or family who don't understand your decisions or something like that, you know? Yeah, I mean, and, and I, I think I have a, a, a different perspective because um, I've been vegan now for, I think, seven years. And, and it, was, it was a slow progression for me because food choices are something that emotionally are just very evocative you know what i mean if if, if suddenly someone is take the most trouble i think i've ever experienced with my family because my very understanding family wonderful guys the time that i came home with my wife for thanksgiving the first time i brought her home for thanksgiving to my family and and we realized that they were not going to cater to us they were not happy with us uh and we were going to have to go out and get some dinner after thanksgiving dinner um you realize that there's going to be a little friction um, sometimes, but I, I think that it's it, if as long as we just sort of demilitarize the issue when it comes to meal on meal, um, I think that really helps. Uh, the other thing is, and I gotta say, I gotta agree with with Hannah because when we made that trip, that was 2016. Is that what you said it was? Was it 16 mm -hmm. that we made that trip? Yeah. Okay, so we could not eat. There was no place to go except the aforementioned Denny's nastiness. But a year later, there were choices all along the way. Like there's chain restaurants now that have vegan choices. I mean, of course you do have to be a little careful about what they're making their food in and, and et cetera. They can call it vegan, but not prepared vegan. But what I'm saying is from someone who 
you know, I'm not happy <laughs> with like, if salad is my only choice, I want to be able to make <laughs> choices. Um, right now, the choices are plenty. And you guys, you have to realize that the things that you go, ugh, I would never eat that, try it once, man. And, mm -hmm. you know, and it, the, the, the choices that are available from, from, you know, whether it's whoever's trying to be on burger at this point, uh, or impossible or or the the cream cheeses that are available and the cheeses and i mean every week it seems there's a there's a new something out there that you can replace what you're currently eating and and it feels better to make a compassionate choice you know and uh and that that i can tell you for sure yeah i have a funny I, I, anecdote on oh go ahead oh no no, no. i was gonna say um it's just interesting because uh, you speak about branching out and trying new things and all, uh, and you'd be surprised. And I just remember the time when we were in Denver and Hannah, me and we went out to dinner and I got those grilled, it was like bar, it's like grilled carrots. And I ate it and I was like, this is the greatest <laughs> oh, yeah. I've ever had. I'm like, this is one of the best things I've ever eaten. I was like, it's just a grilled carrot. But the way that they did it, I was like, this is incredible. And remember, I don't know if you were there when we went, uh, yo, know, we went yeah, the next no, day, I remember. I was like, well, we're going back. And I was like, yeah, I'm here for the carrots. And they're like, we're out of carrots. And I'm like, no, that's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, that was really, really something. I just wanted to add, I'm like so obsessed with vegan cheeses, like obsessed. And at the beginning of the pandemic, um, when everybody was like, ah, like can't get toilet paper, can't get like any of the things we need. I was like, what if there's a vegan cheese shortage? So <laughs> I was like, pricing out bulk vegan cheeses and Andrew kept saying stop doing your cheese math over there because I was like calculating <laughs> crunching numbers like okay like what's the best like bang for my buck versus like how how high is the quality of the vegan cheese and I ended up with these like huge vegan cheese logs that lasted me many months and I ate a lot of vegan cheese but he we just joke about cheese math all the time now like, you math. and your cheese math <laughs> Yeah, man. And I'll tell you, I'm not I'm not shy about shouting out brands and, and like because I really am snobby about like it's got to actually. But I'll never forget. We were doing uh, we, we did this little filming thing where we went and we, we tried to like knock out like all the best vegan Philly cheesesteaks in Philadelphia. And every single one of them had had like certain things in common. And it was about replicating the cheese whiz from, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that goes on the, the Philly cheesesteak sandwiches. And they mm -hmm. all picked different cheeses and they were all freaking amazing. And I'm telling you guys that whatever it is that you want in every city, like I was, when you guys said Denver, I was like, oh, there's great vegan in Denver. Mm -hmm. Great. There's great mm -hmm. restaurants. Um, I'm and hungry now, much, you guys. Me too, man. I'm starving. <laughs> but, you know, in every city, you guys, and I'm talking worldwide, Hannah and I have both been around the world. There's great vegan in every city I've been in. Um, and that's now that's happening now. And uh, just try it. You got just one meal. You got nothing to lose, man. You got nothing to lose. All right. So we got time for one quick last question, um, which is not a quick answer, I know. Um, and then we're going to go into Adam Myatt's Catman Bingo. Um, but it's a question that I was actually curious about. Um, I'm going to shoot this one over to Hannah first, which is, what were you like in high school and what has changed? You got one minute. Oh. Okay, what was I like in high school and what has changed? Honestly, sometimes I feel like I'm, I've been the same person since I was like 14, 15 years old. When I was 15 was right when I, I became vegan at 15. I became dedicated to animals at 15. And I, um, I think I really like found my, my voice around that age. Um, and back then I was a little bit more well, what's changed, definitely. I was much more aggressive as a teenager. I was like, everybody should believe what I believe. And if you don't believe it, then something's wrong with you. And I think now, I, I mean, I've softened so much over the years. I'm not the um, like kind of aggressive advocate that I used to be. I think I'm um, now somebody who really values uh, just like leading by example, doing what I do, hoping that maybe somebody, you know, is into it and wants to, wants to be part of my community with me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I had pink hair. 
I had pink eyebrows. I used to draw my eyebrows on pink. There's a little fun fact. Like real like, um, and pencil thin. Yeah, like pink eyebrows, pink you and too? black hair. Same. I had like a bunch of piercings. I didn't look very approachable, I have to say. Um, and I wasn't very approachable because I was, and you know, my heart was in a good place. I was very, very tender at the core about animal issues and I still am, but I think I had a thick, hard shell around me because I was just so angry about what was happening to animals. And I think now I'm, I let myself be tender more, you know, like I, I let myself just be vulnerable and not have to be like so hardcore or aggressive about things just you know like show people that I am a compassionate person and it's and it's cool to be compassionate you don't have to be angry about it it's all those bats it's all the bats it's the bath bombs it's like the I know. so many soaps and after a while you're not so hard on the outside anymore I just it, Jackson, yeah I took, I took baths thinking? back then I take baths now that's it period. Jackson <laughs> what were you like in high school and what's changed I think the biggest thing that's changed, and look, from the time I was a kid, I knew, just as Hannah was saying, she knew it was all about animals. For me, it was about music. It was about writing. It was about, it was just about learning a, that craft. And, and I always knew that that was where I was gonna, that was it for me. And, um, and I think what, you know, life is such an amazing teacher in, in that way, because I mean, it's not like I'm different. It's just that it comes out in a different way now. I mean, I, I, I think that my approach to animals is much the same as it was um, through art. It's just that the art itself was just very, I guess, self-serving in a way. And I think uh, in terms of creativity, it all gets through a, a higher authority at this point. And I think that, that's really it. I mean, yeah, granted, you know, I don't know anybody who wasn't a little angry, um, but, you know, I was, I was committed to not, I, and it's funny, I think this is where we sort of crisscross, is that I was just, I would, I didn't want to look like any other human being, you know, so I, I was crazy in a lot of the choices that I made, and well, still kind of, anyhow, that's the same a little bit, maybe a little more socially correct, but I, I think that that's the <laughs> biggest change in me is that at some point my relationship to animals just took over everything else and I'm glad it did. Awesome. Well, hey, this is the end. Um, we only went over a tiny bit. Look at that. Not bad.